If you haven't been watching Bears games lately, you're missing out on some wildly entertaining football. And the reason why those games are so fun to watch is because of the absolute dog Chicago has at quarterback, Justin Fields. But before I get into the layers of insanity behind what Fields is doing right now, let me first share a word from the sponsor of today's video, SeatGeek. With playoffs right around the corner, the best football that 2022 has to offer is yet to come. And SeatGeek is the best place there is to buy tickets to your favorite team's games. All you have to do is download their super user-friendly app on your phone and pick from a wide selection of ticket options. When you choose the event that you're interested in, you'll see the layout of the stadium. And when you click on the section that you want to sit in, you can see the view from the exact seat that you're looking at. You can filter through areas of the stadium at the top of your screen, such as the 50-yard line, the end zone, and each sideline. My personal favorite feature that SeatGeek has to offer is their price rating of available tickets. All the green dots you see on your screen represent good deals, and the red dots represent tickets that are overpriced. The app makes it super easy to filter through the overpriced selections and find the best possible deal within your price range. Whether it's a sporting event, concert, comedy show, or something else that you're interested in going to, SeatGeek can get you the best bang for your buck right from your phone. So click the link at the very top of the description to download the SeatGeek app and use promo code BILLY at checkout for $20 off your first purchase. Again, that's promo code BILLY for $20 off your first purchase. A huge thank you to SeatGeek for making today's video possible, but now, back to Justin Fields. Fields was the first rookie I covered over the offseason, and that tape was some of the worst I've ever watched. From coaching to offensive line play to receiver play to quarterback play, it was pure chaos on a play-to-play -play basis, and not the good kind. I've watched a whole lot of bad football, but the 2021 Bears offense rubbed me the wrong way more than anything I had ever watched before because I knew what I saw from Fields in college. He was electrifying at Ohio State dropping bombs to Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson over the top, shaking defenders and throwing missiles into tight windows on the run. I had a blast scouting fields leading up to the 2021 draft, so it was so frustrating to see him in an offense that amplified the worst parts of his game. Even going back to his college days, Fields has always struggled under pressure, so it was no surprise that he was borderline unwatchable when he was thrown behind an offensive line that was terrible in pass protection. Combine that with a coaching staff that refused to design an offense that revolved around his skill set and a receiving core that couldn't separate outside of Allen Robinson, and you get a disaster class the magnitude of which I hope to never see again. But there's always some sort of silver lining. Something that makes you believe that improvement is just around the corner, and Fields did have flashes of brilliance as a rookie. But his performance, combined with the context of what was going on in the Bears organization at the time, led me to believe that the future was very bleak. See, I'm a firm believer in the premise that the fate of a young quarterback in today's NFL is heavily dependent on the team's ability to support him with protection, weapons, and coaching. Fields was deprived of all three as a rookie, and I expected to see more of the same in 2022. The new staff in Chicago made very little effort to get Fields what he needed to develop as a passer. With Jason Peters gone, the offensive line was set to be even worse this year than it was last year. And with Allen Robinson gone, the same was true for the receiving core. The front office was clearly in full rebuild mode, and to me, it was clear that that would come at the expense of Justin Fields' development. Up until week five, I was right. The offensive line was still welcoming pass rushers into the backfield, the receivers were still failing to separate, and Fields was still locking on to his first read. Take this third down from week one against San Francisco as an example. The 49ers are in a cover three buzz with Talanoa Hufanga as the robber, and Chicago's route concept calls for mirrored swirl routes from the number one receivers, and a 15 yard stop route from the number two. Post snap, Fields locks his eyes onto that number two, Darnell Mooney, completely ignoring Hufanga and throws probably his worst interception of the season. Locking onto a predetermined target was a massive issue for Fields in his first season and a half as a Bear, but that was only the tip of the iceberg. His lack of trust in the team around him led to the formation of numerous bad habits, including a lack of trust in what he sees downfield. Here's an example from week two against Green Bay. The Packers are in cover three, and Chicago called a deep shot concept off of play action that tells the number one aligned to the bottom of your screen to run a 15 yard stop route, while the number one at the top runs a go. Equinamia St. Brown burned Eric Stokes off the line of scrimmage, and even though he wasn't the first read in the concept, Fields got there. For whatever reason though, when Fields progressed to St. Brown, he didn't let go of the ball. He instead checked down to his running back out of the backfield, which forced the Bears to punt on the following play. 
Even though there was visible improvement from Fields early in year two, the bad habits were still leading to missed opportunities. From weeks one to five, Fields averaged a respectable 7.7 .7 yards per attempt, but also ranked second to last among starters in completion percentage, passer rating, and interception rate. Progress through those first five games was minimal, but everything changed in Chicago's week six game against Washington. Fields made some awesome plays in that game, the best of which was this perfectly placed 40-yard go ball to Dante Pettis in the third quarter. But two plays that would happen later in the fourth quarter of that week six game really stood out. The first was this third and medium. Chicago called a six concept, which tells each receiver to break back to the ball at the first down marker. But the concept downfield didn't matter because Chicago's offensive line failed to pass off Washington's defensive line stunt. That gave commander's linebacker Cole Holcomb a free shot at Fields in the pocket. But Fields shrugged him off and scrambled for the first down. On what could have been a game-winning drive just a few minutes later, Fields again made a huge play with his legs. This time, Chicago called a fake slant flat combo to the bottom of your screen that's designed to target Dante Pettis downfield on a sluggo route. Despite Fields' pump fake, Pettis never got separation over the top. With nothing else open over the middle, Fields was forced to extend and picked up 39 yards on the ground to put the Bears in the red zone. That set up what should have been a game-winning touchdown when Fields hit Dante Pettis in the hands in the end zone. But even though Chicago lost this game, the fact that they were even in it in the first place was a direct result of Fields making plays with his legs. The offensive coaching staff didn't call a single designed run for Fields in that week six game, but that was nothing out of the ordinary for this Bears offense. According to my own tracking, in weeks one through six, excluding offensive miscommunications, muffed snaps, plays negated by an offensive penalty, short yardage QB sneaks, and kneels, Chicago only called eight designed quarterback runs. Those runs went for a total of just 18 yards, equating to an average of 2.25 yards per carry. So he was far from efficient on the ground, but based on what I saw on film, that was a result of sound run fits from the opposing defense and an incredibly small sample size. Now, I don't think anyone outside of the Bears offensive coaching staff will ever know for sure why they refused to call design run plays for Fields in the first half of the season. In my opinion, it's the same reason why they didn't make an effort to surround him with talented receivers and offensive linemen, which is that they didn't see him as their quarterback of the future. But either way, that week six game served as proof to this Bears staff that ignoring what Fields can do with his legs was severely limiting the potential of this offense. In the following week against New England, Fields doubled his design run total over weeks one through six with an additional eight carries, which went for a total of 54 yards and an average of nearly seven yards per carry. Fields' efficiency on the ground predictably spiked, and design runs have been an integral part of the Bears' offense ever since then. In weeks seven through 11, when, again, excluding muffed snaps, penalties, sneaks, and kneels, Fields has totaled 35 carries for 296 yards, averaging eight and a half yards yards per carry. It only took a year and a half for Fields to be put in an offense designed to bring out the best in him, and even though nothing else has changed outside of the trade for Chase Claypool, he looks like a completely different player. Like I said earlier, Fields has always struggled under pressure. When I scouted him back in the spring of 2021, that was by far my biggest knock on his game. And that trend of poor play under pressure continued through his first season and a half in the NFL. In weeks one to five of this season, when pressured, Fields completed under 30% of his passes, averaged under six yards per attempt, and posted a passer rating of just 23.8. But in week 6 through 11, his completion percentage has increased by over 15%. He's jumped to third in yards per attempt and 10th in passer rating. I don't know if it's simply a confidence thing or something else, but one way or another, Fields has made massive improvements as a passer. The offensive line still can't hold up in pass protection, and the receivers still can't separate consistently. But Fields has made play after play to keep his team in games that they have no business winning. We constantly tear young quarterbacks down for trying to play hero ball, and rightfully so. But when your supporting cast is this bad, you don't really have another choice. And that's the case for Fields right now. Take a look at this play from Week 7 against New England. The Patriots showed one of Bill Belichick's trademark ambiguous pressure looks with linebacker Mac Wilson and safety Jabril Peppers lined up on the line of scrimmage. Now, I'm not 100% certain of what Chicago's pass protection call was, but I can make a pretty good guess. It looks like a half slide to the right, which would typically tell the left tackle and left guard to take the man covering them, while the center, right guard, and right tackle slide out to the right, and the running back has a dual read between number 21, Adrian Phillips, and number 32, Devin McCourty. 
But the reason why I found this play so confusing is because the left guard, Michael Schofield, participated in the slide, leaving Mac Wilson completely unblocked into the backfield. It was either a missed assignment by Schofield or by the running back, David Montgomery. I think the former is the more likely case in this situation, but either way, Mac Wilson got off the line unblocked with a free shot at Justin Fields. The route concept downfield didn't even matter because with immediate pressure up the middle, Fields never got a chance to execute within structure. But despite all that, he made Wilson miss from within the pocket, scrambled out to his left, and delivered a great ball on the move to Cole Komet down the sideline for a gain of 26 on third down. Fields isn't abandoning offensive structure because he's more comfortable improvising. He's abandoning offensive structure because he doesn't have a choice. And he's still constantly making plays. On this one from week 10 against Detroit, Chicago called a rub concept, which tells Byron Pringle to set a pick on Lions safety Deshaun Elliott for Darnell Mooney on an arrow route. But post-snap, Detroit's defensive backs did a great job of switching assignments and taking the concept away. If Fields throws this ball here, it's at best an incompletion with the possibility of a pick six going the other way. So he pulled it down and just did it all himself. The numbers might not lead you to believe that Fields is playing good football, but the film tells a completely different story. What he's doing right now is unbelievable, and if he wasn't under center, the Bears would be the worst team in football. But as exciting as it is to see Fields' talent and toughness finally yield results, we need to keep our expectations for him realistic moving forward. He's still far from where he needs to be for this Bears offense to compete against the NFL's best defenses. And that starts with the most important trait in a quarterback, accuracy. Even since that breakout game in week six, Fields is still constantly missing receivers. His on-target percentage in week six through 11 is just 65.6% .6 according to Sports Info Solutions, which is the second lowest rate in the league. Winning in today's passing league without an accurate quarterback is an extremely tall task, even when that quarterback is a freak athlete. Even guys like Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen wouldn't be elite quarterbacks if they weren't accurate. Fields isn't there yet, and his number one focus moving forward should be accuracy. The other glaring issue with Fields' game that still shows up is his inability to execute quick game concepts. This year, Fields ranks second to last among starters in the rate at which he gets rid of the ball in less than two and a half seconds. And on plays where he does let go of the ball in less than two and a half seconds, he ranks 28th in completion percentage, 31st in yards per attempt, and dead last in passer rating. The bottom line is, he still isn't an accurate passer, and he struggles to operate when he can't hold onto the ball for three seconds. Until he fixes those issues, we'll continue to discuss untapped potential. But if he does fix them, look out, because he's already playing good football in a terrible offense. To be honest, I don't know if Fields will succeed in this league long term. I don't think we've seen enough to declare one way or the other, but it's looking more and more likely that he's Chicago's quarterback of the future every week. It's impossible to watch the Bears offense and not see an incredibly talented, incredibly competitive football player keeping an otherwise bad football team in the game every Sunday. So no matter what the future holds for Fields, you can bet your ass I'm rooting for him, and anybody who enjoys good football should be too. But that's going to do it for today's video. If you'd like to support the channel, links to my Patreon and Twitter will be down in the description. But that's all I've got for now. So until next time, peace.